All right, well, welcome back, everyone. In today's video, we are going to start talking about arrays in C++. All right, so here's our goals for today's video. We'll start out by doing a very quick review on pass by reference and some of our function topics from our previous video. Then we will introduce one-dimensional arrays. And we will learn about how to use them in our C++ programs. We're also going to learn how we can use loops in order to help us manipulate arrays. And we will write some programs which will declare, modify, and output arrays to the screen, and also perform calculations. So definitely follow along in your IDE, and I highly recommend that you try these examples along with me. And finally, we'll talk about best practices for coding with arrays and common mistakes that you'll want to watch out for. So let's first start with a very quick review question on pass by reference. So what we're doing here is we want to write a function definition for a void function called swap values. And so we can see that we have a declaration. And what swap values is supposed to do is it should accept two int type arguments named number one and number two. And what it will do is this function is supposed to exchange the values stored in number one and number two so that the values are swapped. For example, let's suppose I had something like this, where my number one was originally set to five, and my number two was set to 15. If I called swap values, the end result should be that number one now holds the value 15, and number two, my second variable, will hold the value five. So notice we're using pass by reference here in order to interchange those two variables. So let's go ahead and briefly code this up, and let's see how this program would work. And so the first thing to think about is if we are actually going to be interchanging the values, we're going to need a temporary variable. So the first thing we should do is declare a temporary int variable. So that when we start our function, we'll have number one, number two, and some temp variable. So our plan for this program will be we'll first declare this temporary variable named temp, and then when we pass in some values for number one and number two, Notice what we can do is we can use temp to store one of the values. So notice, for example, I could say that temp is equal to number one, and then that would allow me to store number one's value inside temp. Then I could say number one is now assigned the value number two, and then notice, I will still be able to hold my original value. And then finally, the last step, I can set number two to be temp. And if I do that, you will see basically 
my number one now holds number two's value. Number two will hold temp's value, which is five, and then temp will still hold five. But notice here, notice this will allow me to swap the values. So we, we need to be a little careful how we perform that swap in order to make things work properly without overwriting any of our data. Real quick, let's go ahead and code this up for real in CLion. Okay, so here's my starter code. So I have some program here just to test out swap values. So notice in here I can actually call my swap values function. And once I have written that definition, then I would be able to call this function and perform the swap. Of course, right now my definition is missing, so let's go ahead and add that in. So as we discussed, we need to first declare the temporary variable. So I'm gonna just say int temp. I'm gonna go ahead and assign temp number one's value. Then I can set number one and assign it the value held by number two and assign number two temp's value. Notice this will allow us to perform that swap. Let's go ahead and try running this. So notice here, we are asked to enter two numbers separated by a space. So maybe we'll do that five and 15. And notice after calling swap values, first number will hold the value 15, second number will hold the value five. And you can even see if you put a breakpoint and run the debugger that this will indeed be the case. where initially, if we check our variables, we see first numbers five, second numbers 15. But if we run our swap values function, notice we perform the swap. And notice that number one gets changed to 15, number two will get changed to five. And notice that the changes made by the function and passed by reference do indeed transfer from swap values back in to our memory in main. And finally, we see the swap has been completed. So this is a really good practice because we'll see later that arrays also use pass by reference. So after we have introduced arrays in this video, you'll see that these similar ideas can also be used later when we start writing functions with our C++ arrays. All right, so we said today that we were going to talk about arrays in C++. Let's give it a bit of context. Most of the time in engineering, science, and computer science, we generally need to work with large sets of data. And so imagine that you had a problem where you needed to store 100 numbers in your program. And using the tools we know right now, there's basically two ways that we could store 100 numbers. One approach is we could declare 100 variables. For example, we could, if we had 100 whole numbers, we could declare 100 ints. And, and literally type a hundred declarations. Or we could do similar with doubles or floats or whatever, whatever decimal variable we wanted. But that's a lot of work, right? Not super efficient. And our goal here in programming is to be the good kind of lazy, 
We want to be smart and efficient. So this first option is not great. Second option is we could write all our numbers to a data file. You know, we know how to do that. But that's still a lot of work. And it would be kind of a pain if we needed to just change one of the values because we'd have to read and write in order from the file. All right, so we need some more tools to help us manage data better. So let's learn about some more efficient ways to work with large amounts of data in our programs. And that brings us to arrays. Arrays are not the only tool. We're going to learn about other approaches later in this class, so please be aware that arrays are not the only solution. But often they are a good tool for us to use if we have a larger set of data. So one way we could store 100 numbers in C++ is to declare an array. And what this does is it basically will allow us to declare a whole set of variables of a given type. For example, using this syntax here, int my array 100, I can declare a block of 100 int variables with a single line of code. And the interesting thing is each variable is going to have its own unique address. So each variable in an array has what we call its own index, and this allows us to access that value easily. So you can already see that with just a single line of code, we can make a fairly efficient way of storing larger sets of a given data type. So let's take a closer look at how arrays work and what we can do with them. So let's, let's briefly introduce what is an array in C++. So an array is used to process a collection of data of the same type. What that means is we can declare arrays of int variables, arrays of double variables, but we can't mix data types within the same array. So if I declare an array of ints, I can only put int values in my array. So for the purposes of our class, you can't mix data types within a given array. You may learn about workarounds in future programming courses. So why do we need arrays? As we mentioned, arrays make it a lot easier for us to store larger sets of data in our memory. That way we don't have to name all our variables. We don't have to deal with managing each individual variable name. Instead, we can give the whole array a single name and use indexing to easily process each variable. So arrays help us be the good kind of lazy. They help us be efficient. And when I think of arrays, I often think of a shelf, like a nicely organized shelf. You see that each, each of these shelves in this picture has a space for items to be stored. And each shelf can be numbered so that you know that certain items are located on certain shelves. Arrays work in a very similar way. Here's how we declare an array in C++. It's very similar to declaring a variable. For example, if I wanted to declare an int variable, I could just say like int number, right? I list the data type and then the name of the variable 
But for an array, we take it one step further. For an array, we also have these square brackets and a number inside. And so this specifies the size of our array. For example, if I were to declare an int type array named my numbers, and I wanted it to hold five int variables, I could write int my numbers square brackets five. And this syntax, this code, it basically allows us to declare a block of five int variables all at once. We've basically just produced ourselves a nice little bookshelf where we could store different ints in each slot. And so we can neatly store our values inside. And a couple other things to note is that there's no space between the array's name and the brackets. So here, notice there's no space here. We simply take the array name and then right next to the name we put that square bracket for the size. Okay, so once again, it's very important you remember that all items in an array must be of the same data type. It turns out we can make arrays out of any type of data. So we can have int arrays, char arrays, string arrays, double type arrays. And later when we create our own data types, we can even make arrays out of programmer defined types. So it's a really nice tool, but remember, you can't mix different data types within a given array. So an int type array can only hold int type variables. Or just a fun example, if I happened to have some cat type variables, then if I declared an, an array of cat type values, notice only cats could be stored in that cat type array. Later on in this course, we will learn more about programmer defined data types, and we'll see that these types of situations are actually, they do come up where we create our own data types and use arrays. But anyway, the key takeaway to note for now is that you can't mix data types within an array. Arrays have to store the same values within a given array. So you can't have ints and doubles and chars in the same array. So let's take a closer look at how arrays work in the memory. So if I were to declare that my numbers array from before, so here we declared an int type array named my numbers. And it has five elements. So essentially this line of code created our nice, our nice little bookshelf here where I have room to store an int in each of those spaces. So this actually does allocate a block of memory or create a block of memory for us that is large enough to store five int variables. But there's a few very important conventions we want to be careful about. First one is that the array numbering or the indexing it actually starts at zero. So my very first slot within my my numbers array, that will be my numbers element zero. That is the very first item or the zeroth element within my array. And since the numbering starts at zero, notice my last element, 
or the last item in my array, will be my number's element 4. So we end at index 1 fewer than our size. Let's go through a few more key terms, and then we'll start playing around with arrays in C++. So a couple more things to note. In this example where we have int my numbers 5, that whole line of code, that statement, int my numbers 5, that is called the declaration. So that is how we declare our array and let the compiler know that that value exists. Be careful though, because when you declare an array, that does not automatically initialize the array. You still have to initialize the array yourself. My numbers is the name of our array. The value in the brackets, such as the number five in my numbers, that is the number of elements. Sometimes people also call it subscript, index, or size declarator. Basically, that's how big our array is, or how many elements we can store. And then the size of the array actually in bytes, you know, if you want to think about memory capacity, that would literally be the number of elements times how many bytes each element occupies. couple more points. The individual variables making up the array, for example, my numbers 0, my numbers 1, these can be referred to a variety of names, such as indexed variables, subscripted variables, or elements. But once again, remember these very important conventions. The largest index in our array, or the last item, The last index and the last item is one less than the size. So here, the very last item in my, my numbers array is element 4. And remember, the last index is one less than the size because our first index is starting with 0. So my numbers element 0 is our very first element. We call it the 0th element. And my numbers element 4, in this case, will be our last element, since we have just five items. So what actually happens when we declare int my numbers 5? You know, if we go ahead and declare this, put a semicolon at the end, what happens? Well, basically what we're doing is we're allocating memory for five variables of type int. So we have these five ints all together. But interestingly, we only actually remember the address of the zeroth element. So when we declare this array, essentially we store the address of the zeroth element in the variable my numbers. We do not remember the addresses of the other four elements here, but that's okay because if we know where element zero is, then all we need to do is step that many ints down the list in order to find what we want. For example, in order to access my numbers element 3, if I want my numbers element 3, I first go to my numbers element 0. So I start here. And then what do I do? I want to go from 0 to 3, so I go 1, 2, 3. So I step 3 ints down the list. 
or basically three ints farther into the memory. And then I determine the value here must be my numbers element three. So only the memory address of that zeroth element is actually remembered and stored in the name of our array. Let's go ahead and do a couple quick examples before we move on. First, let's try this one. Suppose we want to declare an array named exam scores, which has three double type variables. And then in our second question, we want to declare an array named letter grades with 30 char type variables. Take a moment and pause the video and see if you can do this correctly. Okay, so you'll remember to declare an array, we do the data type, then the array name, and then inside the brackets, we have the number of values. All right, so let's try exam scores. We want it to be double type, so we say double, then the name is exam scores, and there's three elements, so we say double exam scores three, and let's not forget our semicolon. To declare an array named letter grades with 30 char types, we say char letter grades 30. And that will declare the letter grades array with 30 char type elements. Let's try one more. How would you declare an array named my numbers with 20 double types? In this case, remember the correct answer here. We have the data type, the name, number of values, and the semicolon. So choice B is the correct answer. All right, so Let's go ahead and talk a bit more about arrays, and then we'll do some examples. So as we mentioned, an array can have index variables of any type, but remember all index variables in a given array have to be the same type. So you can make arrays of strings, doubles, ints, and even arrays of arrays, which we'll cover later, but all the variables within a given array must be of the same type. Sometimes we call the type of the array the base type. For example, if I have an array named tests5, which has int type, we can say that the base type is int for my int array. If my base type is int, I can only store int variables in that array. All right, so now let's go ahead and cover how do we actually access stuff in our arrays. Here's a very important point. All the data in our arrays must be accessed element by element. This is very important. What that means is that we have to use, we have to use our square brackets and the element number in order to access the data. And Thankfully, each element within a given array is given that unique subscript or index. So as long as we know the name of our array and where the value we want is, then we can easily access it. 
And remember the subscripts here, or the, the element numbers, they always start at zero, and they always end at n minus one, where n is the number of elements. Let's look at some examples. So what I, what I can do is if I have that my numbers array, And if I assume that my element zero is on the left, notice if I say my number's element zero is 39, that will put the number 39 inside my very first slot of my numbers. If I were to then say see out my number's element zero, this would display 39 on the screen. So notice that the name of the array followed by the, the index number, this can be used as a regular variable in a C++ expression. Also, if I were to say C in my numbers element one, say that I gave the number 100. So if we gave 100, to see in, then it would assign that my numbers slot one or my numbers element one the value from see in. And notice that you can also use multiple array elements within an expression. So I could say my number is element three, that's gonna be assigned the value of my number's element zero, which is 39, plus my number's element one, which is 100. So this would be assigned the value 139. Other things to note, you can even put integers and variables inside the square brackets. So as long as it's a whole number, here, for example, if i was zero, I could say c out my numbers element i. That's the same as writing c out my numbers element zero. And this would give me, in this case, would output 39 to the screen. So here's a very important point to remember. As we said before, we have to access data in our arrays using the individual elements. So you must have the array name and the element number in square braces. For example, if I were to just try to output C out my numbers, this is actually going to tell us the memory address where my numbers element zero is stored. So the name my numbers just holds the location of element zero. That's it. So the name my numbers holds a memory address. It does not actually hold a value that is stored in the array. It only tells us where that element zero is located. So if we want to output all of our array elements to the screen, then we have to use the index number in square brackets. Let's try another quick question. Suppose we declared an array here named tests, and tests contains the following five values in memory. So let's say that we declared, in this case, like int tests element five. So suppose we declared tests and we initialize it 
so that we have the values shown. So here's tests element zero, and here is tests element four. So what value would we get if we outputted C out tests element four? In this case, the correct answer is 55. Since numbering starts at zero, since numbering starts at zero, remember that test element four is actually going to give us the fifth item in that array. So we step one, two, three, four, and that gives us the value 55. So be careful to remember that numbering starts at zero and the last item in our array will be element n minus one. So hopefully you remember for loops and what we covered in our previous videos on for loops. It turns out that for loops are extremely useful when working with arrays, because nobody wants to have to write a million lines of code in order to modify an array. You might remember we mentioned that it's a good practice to start your for loops with the counter at zero and not at one. The reason for this is because arrays start with index zero. And often we use for loops to manipulate arrays. So definitely get in the habit of starting your for loop counter at zero. So notice we could do something like this. Start your for loop counting variable at zero. And the reason for this is because if we wanted to output something like my numbers element i, notice this for loop would output all values of my numbers to the screen. So remember to start your for loop counter at zero so that you remember to include the very first element in that array. Let's go ahead and take a look at a very short example. It's a little cheesy, but I think it's still helpful to just review these basics. So notice what we're doing in this sample program. The very first thing we did is we have this code const int array size equals five. This is declaring a constant integer value or a constant int value named array size. So it's a very good practice when working with arrays to use constants to specify the size of that array. And you'll see the reason why this is convenient is every time we want to use the size of the array in our program, then it will automatically use whatever value we assigned array size. And that also makes it really easy. So if we change our mind and we need to change the size of our array, we just change array size. In this case, we've assigned array size the value five. So that means in our second line, we're declaring an int array named numbers, which has a size of 
5 in this case. Notice we first use a for loop to output the values to the screen, and we're going to see that the values are in uninitialized at first. In the second part of our program, we use a for loop going from element 0 all the way through array size, and we assign each element the value 99. And then finally, we use a third for loop to output the values to the screen. Let's demonstrate this program in C line. All right, so here's our sample code. And you can see we've declared that constant int value. So that's going to be just a constant in our program set to 5. And then we have the rest of our code here in order to process our array. So if we go ahead and run this, you'll see exactly what happens. Is first, if we try to output our array's initial values before we've even initialized anything, notice what we get. We get that our first value is some random garbage, and then second value, 70, and then more random stuff. That is because our array is initially completely uninitialized, and so we are unable to actually have any valid information there. But all we need to do is use a second for loop to actually assign each element of value. So you can see what we do is we assigned each element in our array the value 99. And here we used the variable count to represent each individual element. So we ran this for loop, so every element starting with element 0, ending with element array size minus 1, every element was assigned to hold the value 99. So you can see, using that bit of code and those three loops, we were able to initially output our uninitialized array. We assigned each element the value 99. And finally, we were able to successfully verify and show that each element in our array had been initialized to hold the number 99. Suppose we changed our mind and we decided we wanted our array to have 10 elements. Because we have this constant array size, notice if I change array size to 10 and rerun my program, all of a sudden I now have 10 elements in my array. No problem. Or if I change my mind again, say I just want to have two elements. Well, that's okay too. As long as I have at least one element, then this is going to run just fine. So using a constant to specify the array size makes it really easy to have that constant to refer to any time we want to access array size. And then if we ever need to change array size, we can just edit the value that we had assigned our constant. You might be wondering, why didn't we give array size a variable? Why did we have to use a constant? That's because generally C++ standard requires that you use an actual constant or number value in order to specify the array size. So many compilers won't run at all if you use just a plain old variable to specify the array size. CLion will actually still run, but some compilers will not. So to play it safe, to make sure your program runs on all C++ compilers, make sure you use a constant or a number value in order to specify the size of your array. You don't want to use a variable to specify the array size.
Let's try one more example just for fun. Suppose we wanted to declare a double type array named test scores, and test scores contains 30 elements. We want to initialize all items in test scores to 100 and then use a loop to output the values to the screen. Let's give this a try. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this program. So we want to declare an array named test scores with 30 double type elements. And then we want to initialize each element to 100. And then we want to output the values to the screen. Let's go ahead and give this a try. And we'll see it's actually fairly straightforward. To declare the array, we just say double test scores element 30, like this. Or we could also declare some constant. For example, something like this. We could say constant size is 30. That would, that would also accomplish the same result. Notice constants get all capital letters for their name, and we have to use the const modifier in front of int. Next, we need to initialize each element to 100. So theoretically, I could do something like this. But you know, that's an awful lot of code. Rather than writing each element is 100, let's use a for loop. I'm going to go ahead and use i as my counting variable. That's very common. Let's say for int i is 0, i is less than, in this case, let's say size. That's the number of elements. And I increment my counter by 1 each time. I can say, OK, take my ith element in test scores and assign it the value 100. This will assign the ith element the value 100. And then finally, if we want to output the values to our screen. Easiest way is to use another for loop. And in this case, we just use a C out statement, and then we can say C out test scores element i. And I'm going to put ENDL in there to have each output on a new line. All right, so if we go ahead and run this one, look what we get. Notice here we're getting the number 100 outputted 30 times. And if we wanted to, we could add a little bit more code to our for loop. And we could say, for example, element number i contains test scores element i. So if we do this, notice we'll actually see each element being counted from 0 all the way through 29. And there you go. You see element number 0 contains 100. Everybody contains the values 100. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about processing array contents. And if there's one thing you remember from today's video, this is one of the big key points that you'll want to make sure you remember. The general rule is that you need to use loops in order to manipulate contents of an array. Remember, we have to manipulate contents of an array element by element, or one item in square brackets at a time. 
Remember, we have to use the numbers in our square brackets in order to access the values stored in our arrays. So what we'll do next is we'll look at a few examples of how to complete various tasks with arrays, and then we'll do a few more practice programs. So first example, to output array contents to the screen, we already saw that you need to use a for loop with a cout statement. And so you have to output all elements from element zero to element n minus one. Next, if you want to compare arrays, then you need to use a loop and an if statement. And once again, you have to compare each item one at a time, element by element. Another important one, to set one array equal to another array, you cannot just use the assignment operator. You have to use a for loop and you have to go element by element. Element zero of one array must equal element zero of the second. Element one must equal element one of the other array and so on. You have to go use a for loop and assign each element one at a time. Next is summing and averaging. Like usual, you'll use a for loop and you'll need to use a summing variable to calculate cumulative sum and a counting variable to calculate how many items you have read. And then you can divide your sum by your count in order to determine your average. Finally, to find the maximum or minimum value, it's kind of similar to some of our loop activities earlier, you can use a variable to hold the minimum and the maximum values. And then what you do is you use a for loop to read one array element at a time. And if statements can be used to compare each element within that array to the current maximum and minimum. Let's briefly look at examples of each of these tasks. And then we'll try a couple more practice programs. First, let's look at outputting an array's contents to the screen. Once again, you need to use a for loop and see out statements to display each element one at a time. So notice here, we use the for loop and the see out statement. Let's go ahead and Try this program in C Lion. So here we have our values, and here, just to, for convenience, I use these curly braces to initialize my array. But notice here, I have to go element by element and output element i of my first array and element i of my second array using these for loops. Just for fun, let's try something else. If we output C out first array, we get, and let's just see what the value first array stores. And then similarly, if we try to output C out second array, let's see what value is stored in the name second array. So let's, let's move these up just a little. And let's go ahead and run this example. So notice, if we try to just output C out first array, look what we got. That is not the contents of first array. This 
bunch of numbers and letters here, that is the memory address where first arrays element zero is stored. And similarly, second array is being stored at a different memory address. But if we use our cout statement within the for loop, we see that first array initially has the values of zeros, which is what we had initialized it to. And second array has the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because that is what we had initialized. So you cannot just say cout array name in order to get the values in the array. You have to use a for loop with a cout statement to output each element one at a time. So please make sure you remember that as you work with loops and arrays. Our next example is to compare arrays. And you can see in this short example, what we basically have done here is we have two arrays, first array, second array. We have a flag variable that will basically initially set to true. And notice what we do here is we're comparing our two arrays. And as long as our arrays are equal, we'll keep checking each item in our array to see if those two elements are equal. And then once we have checked all of the arrays, we can then output either yes, the arrays are equal, or no, if we identify something's not the same. So here's that example for comparing the arrays. Initially, these two arrays have been declared and initialized to hold the same values. So if I were to run this program, we'll see that the arrays are equal. So notice here, we see, yes, indeed, the arrays are equal. Let's suppose I want to be kind of mean and change it. Let's make second array not equal anymore. We changed element 2 to hold the value 12. One thing we can do here is we can also modify this program to tell us which element is not equal. So if we wanted, we can add a cout statement here saying element count does not match. So notice if we do that, we would expect that element 2 will be detected as the element not matching in these two arrays. And what do you know? That's exactly what happens. So we compare first array element count to second array element count, and we see element 0 and 1 are the same, but element 2 is not. And so that triggers this if statement, and we end. All right, next one, setting one array equal to another array. So big key message for this one, don't try to set one array equal to another array using the name only. So here, if I have first array and second array, we can't just say, we can't use first array equals second array. That won't work. We have to set arrays equal to each other one element at a time using a for loop. And so that's exactly what we do in this sample program. Here I want to set first array to hold the same values as second array. So I say first array element i equals second array element i. And everything goes in that for loop. This way we are setting the arrays equal element by element, one item at a time.
So if we see, once again, our example in sea lion, we can show that by setting first array element i equal to second array element i, we are, we are able to give first array the same values that second array holds. So if we run this program, notice we see that first array initially is all zeros, second array is one, two, three, four, five, but if we run the loop to set them equal, both first array and second array now have the same values. So the key takeaway here is I cannot just simply say first array equals second array. In fact, if I do that, look what happens. C lion won't even compile. It's saying array type int five is not assignable. It's basically saying, hey, you can't set this memory address equal to that memory address. This isn't going to work. And I can't even run. I'm getting a compiler error. Invalid array assignment. So if I want to set one array equal to another, I have to use a for loop and initialize element by element such that first array element i is assigned the value stored in second array. So we cannot use, use first array equals second array. Next one, summing and averaging array elements. This is a really important thing to know, and this is often a common assignment and exam question. So it's very important that you know how to find the sum average, minimum, and maximum of elements in an array. Thankfully, it's actually pretty straightforward to do this. So you'll notice in this case, what we do is we can use a summing variable. And here, this is going to add each element i to a cumulative sum. So this variable sum is basically tracking the sum of all the elements. And of course, remember to initialize the summing variable to zero before starting to sum. And finally, in this case, I went ahead and calculated average by dividing sum by size. But often it's also helpful to use a counting variable especially if you don't want to sum every single element. Like if you only wanted to sum the first three elements and find the average, then you wouldn't necessarily want to use size here. You could also use a counting variable. Let's try running this one in C Lion. So here we have our array, my array, with five elements. And we've initialized our summing variable. And you can see here we are going ahead and calculating our sum and average. And so notice that the summing variable sum is being incremented so that each time this loop runs, we are adding the next value in the following element to the variable sum. So if we do that, we see that we are able to calculate sum and average. We determine that our sum is 15 and the average is 3. So we're successfully able to go through this for loop and add each element one by one to the summing variable and then output the total sum and average to the screen. So remember, it's really important. You have to use these summing variables and add each element one at a time to the sum using a for loop. The next one is finding the minimum and maximum values in an array. As I mentioned, this is a very common problem and often something asked on homework assignments and exams. So typically a good approach to use here is you want to declare variables to store your maximum and minimum value. And often you have no idea what the maximum and minimum will be. So sometimes we choose to initialize our minimum and maximum to be the very first item in the array as a starting point. 
That way we don't have to guess what our minimum and maximum will be. We simply compare all the other values to the very first value in our array. So again, a common practice is to use element zero as the initial minimum and maximum value. Once we've set up that as our initial minimum and maximum, each other element is compared to that minimum and maximum. And once again, in order to perform that comparison, we have to go element by element. So we have to compare element i of our array, starting with 0, ending with n minus 1. We compare each element i one at a time with the maximum and minimum. If the element we're reading is larger than the current maximum, then it becomes the new maximum. If the element we're reading is smaller than the current minimum, then that element becomes the new minimum. So we compare the element i and we make that element the maximum or minimum if we detect that element i is greater than the current maximum or less than the current minimum. Let's go ahead and give this a try. So here we have our sample program and notice we have my array with five elements and we initialize our initial max to be the very first element, initial minimum to also be very first element. So here these will initially hold the value one. And then we output our values to the screen and then we use a for loop to determine the maximum and minimum. And then we output to the screen. And once again, we see that the maximum will be 5, the minimum is 1. And notice it was a good idea to use the very first element as the initial value to compare, because that way 2, 3, 4, and 5 were automatically compared to 1 as our initial max and min. So make sure when you are finding minimum and maximum that you do remember to use these variables max and min and that you initialize them to a valid initial minimum and maximum. All right, let's go ahead and try a couple more practice examples before we move on. Suppose we want to declare an array named backwards even numbers. And this array should contain 50 elements and we want each element to be a even number in decreasing order starting with 100. So for example, the elements should be starting with 100, then 98, 96, and so on. We want to output all these values to the screen. And then we want to determine average minimum and maximum of those values in our array. Alright, so here we are in CLion. Let's go ahead and code up what we're trying to do. First, we need to declare the array. We called it backwards even numbers with 50 elements. Then we want to initialize the array to have even numbers in decreasing order, starting with 100. And then finally, we want to find average, minimum, 
and maximum and output the values to this screen. So first to declare the array, that's pretty straightforward. Here we're working with whole numbers, so I'm going to just go ahead and set up backwards even numbers like this. So we have 50 elements. And next, I want to initialize my array. So to do that, I need to use a for loop. So I'll use variable i to help me as I go through. I'm going to loop through all 50 elements. So i will continue till I'm equal to 50. And I'm going to increment by 1 each time. So here, I need to assign each element the values so that element 0 is 100 and later elements are even numbers in decreasing order from 100. That means that backwards even numbers element 0 is going to be 100 backwards even numbers element 1 is going to be 98, element 2 is going to be 96, and so on. More generally, I can write that backwards even numbers element i is going to be equal to 100, initially, minus 2 times i. Because element 0 is going to be the value 100, Element 1 will be the value 98, or 100 minus 2, and so on. Next, I needed to output the values to the screen, so I can do that in the same for loop. So I can go ahead and, once I've initialized that value, I can go ahead and output it to the screen. I'll put some code here, initializing backwards even numbers. So we initialize. So that's done. Before we find average, maximum, and min, let's just go ahead and test out what we have so far. Let's verify that that for loop works. And indeed, look at that. We see that our zeroth element contains 100, and we have 50 elements, so our last element will contain the value 2. So we've successfully initialized. Next, we need to do average, min, and max. So we need to make sure that we give ourselves a summing variable. Just be safe, I'll use sum and initialize to 0. I'm going to use a counting variable named count, and I'll also use a double variable named average. I also need an int variable, but just to be safe, I'll call it double in case there would, would have been a decimal anywhere. I also need minimum and maximum. So I'll use element 0 as my initial minimum and max. So therefore, in this case, I will say that min equals backwards even numbers element 0, and max equals backwards even numbers element 0. Then I just need to go ahead and use another for loop. In this case, I just need to go through all 50 elements in my array. And in this case, what do I do? Well, each time I need to read an element and calculate the cumulative sum. So I need to add element i to my sum. So sum will be equal to sum plus backwards even numbers element high. 
then I need to increment count to track the number of values I've read. So I will say count plus plus. And finally, I need to check for a new minimum and maximum. So I can use if statements. If my current element is less than my current minimum, then if I'm less than my current minimum, then I update my minimum. So if I detect something smaller than my existing minimum, then I update. And I use the same approach for maximum. So if I find that my current element that I'm reading is greater than my maximum, then I need to update my maximum value. Once I've finished my loop, then I can just output my results to the screen. There's some. Let me output my sum. The average is, and I output my average. And then finally, maximum and minimum. So if we do that, we'll be able to calculate everything. Oh, but notice there's one thing I forgot. I forgot to calculate my average. So remember, first trust your IDE. It gave me a very clear warning that I'm uninitialized. But I know that here average is just going to be the sum divided by how many values I read. So I calculate average and then display it to the screen. And that's it. So I use my for loop to determine cumulative sum, count how many values I've read, and determine minimum and maximum using if statements. Let's go ahead and run this. And we can see our sum is about 2,500, average is 51, minimums 2, maximums 100. And that exactly matches what we would expect for this array. So I highly recommend you go back through this example and make sure you really understand it. This is really good practice. All right, so now that we've done a few examples, let's finish up with a few good practices and things to watch out for. So here's a summary of the good practices and things to watch out for with arrays. We'll go through these briefly in more detail in just a moment. First good practice, generally you want to use constants to specify the size of an array. We've already seen that this makes it a lot easier to update and change the value of the array size, and it ensures that our program will compile and run because some compilers will not accept variables when specifying, specifying the array size. Next good practice, remember to initialize all the values in your array. Third, pay attention to your array size and be careful of what's called an out of range error. And finally, be careful to avoid off by one errors in arrays. So good practice number one, remember you should use constants when declaring the size of an array. So you'll see in most of our example programs and in our assignments, we generally do this. Using a constant makes it a lot easier for us to control the size of our array. And with just one line of code, we can easily alter the size of our array if we need to change the size of that array. So here we would just modify our constant array size if we need to change how many things are in that array. 
So one other thing to be careful of is please do not use a variable to specify the size of your array. While the C Lion compiler will allow this, technically C++ standard and most compilers will actually not allow the use of a variable to specify the size of an array. So be careful here. Generally, in many compilers, the, you cannot use a variable to specify array size. This is because the computer and the compiler need to know ahead of time how much space to save for that array. Later, we're going to learn about a workaround using dynamic arrays, but for now, we cannot use variables to specify array size. Let's try a Cody sense question. Suppose I declare this array tests five, and then I immediately output tests element zero. Take a moment and use your Cody sense. What do you think will happen when this see out statement triggers? So it turns out the correct answer here actually depends on your compiler. But what will happen is you'll, you'll either not compile, output zero, or output a random number. That's because test element zero is currently uninitialized. So again, the behavior depends on how your compiler treats uninitialized variables. We see with C lion, we get a random number. That leads us to our good practice number two. All elements in a local array are uninitialized by default. So do not assume your arrays are initialized. You need to remember to initialize them using a for loop. And again, how do we initialize arrays? Most commonly, we use a for loop. In our earlier examples, you may have seen this curly braces notation. That is called using an initialization list. So if you have a very small array, then you can use curly braces and commas to initialize the values in the order in which they appear. Generally, this is not usually a good practice for our class. So most of the time, I will require that you always use a for loop to initialize arrays. Initialization lists are really only used if you have an extremely small array and you're just trying to do something fast. But for our purposes, we always want to use a for loop just to make sure that we can handle any size array. Let's try another Cody sense question. What will we get if we have some array tests as shown here. So we have tests with five elements. And we want to output tests element five. What's going to happen here? Well, remember, array numbering starts at zero. So this is tests element zero. There's number 75. Then we have element one element two, element three, element four. Well, wait a minute. Test element five is outside the array. Because remember, array numbering starts at zero. So in this case, you need to be very careful. Most of the time, what will happen in this case is choice D. The C out statement is going to step five elements past test element zero and it's going to read whatever memory is inside the thing that comes after test element four. So be careful here. This is called an out of range error. And so some if you if you try to access tests element five, even though our indexes are zero through four, this will 
actually be accessing data outside of the array, out of range of the array. And be careful here because an out of range index will not always produce an error message. And most of the time your program will still run. So you have to pay attention to the size of your array. Make sure you don't go out of the range. Remember, if your array has n elements, you start at index 0, you end at index n minus 1. Another example, if we have tests 5 and we try to write the code tests 5 equals 100, that is actually going to overwrite the memory outside the array. And there may not be a warning. So you got to be really careful not to go out of range when working with arrays. All right, and our last good practice, make sure you avoid off by one errors when working with arrays. So you might remember that an off by one error in a loop is when your loop counting variables and your outputs are off by one value. And this similar issue can happen in arrays where your array subscripts or element numbers are off by one. So be careful to check that you start your for loops at element zero. Sometimes if you accidentally start your for loop at element one, then you will create an off by one error. So once again, please be careful to avoid making these mistakes with arrays. It's very good practice to follow these rules. Hopefully by now you're starting to get a little bit more comfortable using one-dimensional arrays in programs. So please take some time to go back through those example programs that we covered and make sure that you start getting comfortable using one-dimensional arrays in your programs. It's especially important that you know how to write for loops in order to manipulate arrays. So definitely follow those practices and remember that we need to manipulate arrays element by element using a for loop in order to access and change the data. And finally, be careful to watch out for those common mistakes that we covered, especially using constants to specify our size initializing our arrays properly, and being careful to avoid out of range and off by one errors. So thanks everyone for joining the fun. And in our next video, we will go into more detail on how to use arrays with functions. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.